I was really going crazy and I had an emergency session with my therapist and she uh, was like, well, you know, you're also going through this thing that like really intensely parallels your real life and it was a true eureka, aha, like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't see this earlier kind of moment. Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and the poetically named man next to me is Will Brill. You probably know him from the OA, the beloved, insanely, obsessively. Wild and weird. Yeah, we have the the best and weirdest and coolest cult following there is, I feel like. Probably, and yeah, one of the best in all of television. I also know you, of course, from Maisel. Mm -hmm. um, loved you on that. And um, most recently, uh, I saw you as Roy Cohn in Showtime's yeah. Fellow Travelers. I have a lot of questions about that. We're going to get to them. But if you are lucky enough to be in New York, and you are luckier still to be able to get a ticket, you might know him as the recent Tony winner for the most Tony-nominated Broadway show, Broadway play of all time. Mm -hmm. So take that, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I guess. So eat it, Death of a Salesman, because there's a new play in town. It's called Stereophonic. Congratulations. Thank and you. welcome, Will Brill. Thank you. Let's talk about this show. So it's not a musical. Mm -mm. It's a play with music. Mm -hmm. It's not about Fleetwood Mac. No. Yeah, no. Okay, so what what is what is Stereophonic? I think Stereophonic is a play about a band recording an album, but it is to to explode that um, very specific scene. It is also about a group of artists creating a piece of art together, but on an on an even more macro level, it's about one person and the fights they get in with themselves about um, you know how they uh, compromise with themselves, how they negotiate against themselves and for themselves when making art or when making relationships with other people, and how uh, harrowing and fulfilling that process can be. And let's just also say it is a band in the 70s. Uh -huh. It is an Anglo-American band Correct. with couples. Yes. Uh, but it's not Fleetwood Mac. It's not Fleetwood Mac. It's not Fleetwood, and it's not it's not Fleetwood Mac. But yeah. there are there are some parallels. There's sure some similarities. Sure. And you play Reg. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about this guy because you've also had a long journey with Reg. Yeah, yeah, I have. I I first came to this play. I actually there's a there's a <laughs> my most recent text from David Adjmi is him saying I st he said I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but like. It is still flabbergasting to me that, you know, 10 years ago we met and I had never seen you act before and I said you're going to be in this play someday. I mean, it's really bizarre. It was, it was 2014 or 15 and we met in a cafe and um, he had written seven pages of the show and uh, didn't know me from Adam, but he said, I, I really think you're going to be in this at some point. And so my, my relationship with Reg started there. At the time, I was, um, I, I was kind of an alcoholic myself. I was, I was drinking a lot. Um, I was also engaged to be married. Um, and now, nine years later, I'm on the, I'm, I'm on, I'm in a very different place on that journey. I'm divorced. I'm sober. Um, and, uh, the, these are these are the primary issues that Reg wrestles with in this show. Um, so yeah, I've had a long journey with it, artistically, temporally, emotionally, um, and I feel really lucky and bizarre to be in this place with it. I mean, we never expected that this would. I mean, I think there was a part of us that never expected the show to go at all. So for for David and I to both have Tonys at the end of it is. Real, or in the middle of it is very peculiar. I want to ask you a little bit more about that because you thanked your therapist in your Tony speech. Oh, you have sure. you've thanked your therapist. You've re referenced your therapist again and again and again. You on this long journey, this decade long journey, it took you a while to connect the dots between mm -hmm. you and Reg. Oh yeah, yeah. You didn't see. No. Wait a minute. This guy's story sounds a little familiar. Yeah, no, for sure not. It's such a weird thing, you know. I think I think actors actors get into their characters in all different kinds of ways and for me it has 
for a, for a very long time, it's started, and I'm trying to move away from this actually, but it starts with a voice. It starts with what the character sounds like. And so the first time I read Reg, I thought, oh, this is what he sounds like. It, and, and I knew kind of exactly. So it just felt like he was living in my imagination. That that's like where he started and ended. And then there was a day in tech at Playwrights Horizons where I had, uh, I was two or three days off my antidepressants. And um, I was really going crazy and I had an emergency session with my therapist and she uh, was like, well, you know, you're also going through this thing that like really intensely parallels your real life and it was, a true eureka aha like oh my god i can't believe i didn't see this earlier kind of moment um yeah and so and you know without her i don't know that i would be well enough sane enough happy enough to be brave enough to be tackling this kind of thing there was a there was a, a moment a very real moment in uh early on when i didn't know if i could do this show and it was really my therapist and my girlfriend talking me through the pros and cons that kind of allowed me to dive in. This is a really, I mean, you've done challenging roles, you've done challenging things, but this is a uniquely daunting production. You are, if I'm not mistaken, the only Broadway veteran in the cast. Everyone else, it's their first time on Broadway. Yeah. You are a band that was created for this show of almost all non-musicians. Yeah. You had to learn to play the bass for this. Yeah, yeah. I learned to play the bass. I had learned to, I had learned to fake playing guitar twelve years ago for a movie, which, on for for a film project, and that is so wildly different than having to actually play in front of eight hundred people every night. Um, fortunately, I had a really good teacher who was my teacher for both, and I shouted him out at the Tonys too, actually, Robbie Mangano. Um, but yeah. It's, it's been really, that aspect of it is, the whole show is so meta. I mean, we are right now, kind of um, an untalked about thing in the industry is like, you know, in a long running successful show like this, one of the, one of the gritty details is that we're uh, extending, the run is extending, and all of the actors have to renegotiate our contracts in order to stay in it. And so the whole cast has been having these really intense meetings with each other about, okay, what is important to you? What is important to you? What are you scared about? What? And we have never felt more like a band. I mean, this is, these are the really, really difficult talks. And I was on the phone with the director today saying, I, can't, I kind of can't believe how moving and fulfilling this part of it is. This is the scariest part and it's the most rewarding because we're all being so supportive and so honest with each other. And you are, there's a real-ish studio on the stage yeah. and when the mics are off, you talk to each other. That's right. You, th there's a whole other side to this story that we don't know that you are inventing live pretty much every night. Yeah, that's right. That's so cool that you pick up on that because not everybody, I think people sort of assume that when they see us back there and the lights are low and the and the microphones are off that the show is still kind of is just happening as it is but those are really amazing moments to be able to be with the rest of the cast and you know m make a fart joke or just like to just like kind of reach out and grab each other and say everybody good are we okay are we all like is this show okay um, that's a really valuable time to have on stage. The little fishbowl crucible um, terrarium is a really special place for us. And crazily, it is a working studio. I mean, when we play that music and the audience hears playback, that is the exact take that we just played, which is so cool. It's really cool. And you, we don't know the band's name in the show, but yeah. you have a name. We do, yeah. It's a secret. <laughs> it's um, it is discoverable. It's out there. All if right. you, it's um, but I I would love in the spirit of like the OA, like you know, go go out there and do your reach research, see you what know, you can uh, find. Challenge accepted. Well, okay, great. <laughs> I I love it. I want to ask. Um, first of all, I just want to say, for those who can't see the show, can't get to New York, this is also. I mean, this is. I don't want to jinx anything, but this is one of the 
biggest Broadway phenomenons in years. Yeah. I don't want to say the H word, but this is one of the biggest, and it is really taking off now yeah. on Spotify. Right? Yeah. People are really, really, it's not a musical, but you can listen to the songs, mm -hmm. and people are really, really vibing with these songs. It's, it's a, crazy. It's great. By the way, like, talk, talk about the music a little, because you're going to get great music. Yeah, yeah. The Will mu Butler. The music, yeah, Will Butler is so amazing. They did this really amazing thing where Will Butler and uh, our sound designer, Ryan Rummery, and our music director, uh, Justin Craig have all been working on this music together for the past decade. I mean, they all signed on before there was a script, um, which is a really amazing thing that David and Daniel Aachen, our director, were able to do to assemble this team so that the whole thing could grow so organically. Um, Will Butler is a musical genius. He was in Arcade Fire and is now uh, uh, embarking on a thing that is kind of a hybrid solo project, but also with his wife's band. Um, so there's Sister Squares and there's Will Butler and they um, are working together and it's so fun. It's so cool. It's different, but it's also similar. Anyway, um, he wrote this really amazing music and then Justin Craig did this really amazing thing where he, you know, had these uh, actors who were actors first and musicians second and he was able to take Will Butler's beautiful songs and craft them around these sort of novice musicians without sacrificing any of the musical integrity. So the, the songs sound amazing and somehow we are able to play them. I mean, it's just a, a perfect storm. Something that is so crazy is I didn't play bass at all before this. And there is a line in the, in the play where Peter says to Reg, um, I love that, I love that bass line. You have to keep that. And uh, I'm doodling on my bass line. And that, the bass line that I play in that moment is a bass line that I came up with in, um, when we were jamming on another song and Will Butler said, oh, that bass line is really cool. Can you actually put that in Seven Roads? Which was a song that we were trying to find the vibe of in the rehearsal room. It used to sound totally different. And so now, I have a bass line in an original cast recording. It's something that I never would have dreamed of, but the whole show is sprinkled with that kind of stuff. And yeah, I mean, the New Yorker called us out, like, Drive is gonna rival Espresso for the Song of the Summer, which was like such a cool shout out. I love the music, I'm like a... I love the music too. It's cool. I was really happy when I saw the show and realized that I could then go listen to the music. It made yeah. me really happy to just Bring that up on my Spotify, like literally in the Uber home. Yeah, that's how that's how tight this this music is. I want to ask you. I'm someone who's been going to Broadway shows my whole life. Mm -hmm. It feels a little different now. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's post pandemic, but I've noticed coming back into shows. I open up my playbill. There is a long list now in our playbills asking us to behave and ways in which oh, to behave wow. as an audience. You open it up and it says, "We know there are long lines for the bathrooms. Please be patient." Please be respectful of the cast. Please don't. Wow. Please don't interact with the cat. Like please, all of these things. Please be respectful of the people who work here. If you're inebriated, please leave. Like there's a long list. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, Why? and that's pretty new, Will. Yeah. I want to ask you: Are you, as a cast, an actor who's been doing this for a long time, are you noticing that maybe audiences are? acting out a little more? Are you finding a little worse behavior you, lately? You know, I um, uh, actually, I don't know if it's because we're lucky to be in the show that we're in. There is something about our show. I think because it's so documentary-esque, I think people maybe feel like they're being watched a little bit. So there is this like peculiar phenomenon. It's one thing to be in a 200 seat theater and say something outlandish and have the entire audience be stone still. But in a Broadway house with 800 people in the audience, that's like, that's rare. And it's something that happens a lot in our show. Um, and I don't particularly know what that's about, but yeah, I've been in, I mean, I've been in shows where people are yelling at the stage. I was in a production of Our Town, was my first job in New York City. And with there, Michael Shannon. Yeah, yeah, with Michael Shannon, and I got to do it with all of uh, all of the guys who played the um, all of the men and women. Helen Hunt also played the uh, stage manager in that production. Um, but what was cool was it was a twenty-seven member cast um, that 
ran the absolute gamut of uh, ages. So it was this generational, super diverse play. Um, and so we had all of these stories about bad behavior in the theater. And um, you would not believe what people are willing to say to a cast. I mean, it's really nuts. Um, so I don't personally feel that it has gotten worse, particularly on this show, but I, I might be spoiled. I want to ask you, I, I, you could have heard a pin drop when I saw it. Yeah. It was like that, the, the, the moment, was, it just felt sacred in that, yeah. in that space. But I want to ask you about um, Roy Cohn. Yeah. I want to ask you about that character. Um, Roy Cohn, um, coward, victim, bully. Yeah, bully, coward, victim, yeah. As it says on, his, on the AIDS quilt. Yeah. Playing a man like this, he's a real person. Yeah. You, no one is the villain of their own story. Yeah. When you're playing a real person like that, and doing it so, so well, Thanks. like so hateful, so horrible, and then these moments of absolute heartbreaking tenderness. Yeah. What is it like, how did you approach this character? I, you know, it, I was so nervous because he is so iconic. Um, I was given a real gift by that creative team. You know, generally when you audition for a project, you make a tape and then you're called in for casting and then you're called in for the director and then you're called in for the entire creative team and then all the producers. And somehow this project, I sent in a tape and three weeks later got a call saying, you're Roy Cohn. Um, so it was really bananas um, that I was given that amount of trust and I, and I felt a real responsibility in a number of directions. I mean, he's he has been played iconically by some of the most iconic people alive. Al Pacino. Al Pacino, Nathan Lane. Like, um, he's really, so to, so to not break the mold, but to, to just fit into that canon is super daunting. Um, and then also, like you said, he's this real person who had a very, rich and very complicated life. So um, I watched the documentaries, um, Bully Coward Victim and Where's My Roy Cohn, which are both amazing in their own right. And then I read a biography that is written about him also that's called Citizen Cohn. And, it, and, and that really does a very great service to the understanding of this kind of person and the ability to have empathy for this kind of person because Roy, died of AIDS at the, you know, during the crisis. He died a month after I was born, I think, in his mid-50s. And the first chapter of the biography describes in detail what Roy specifically went through. And um, it's horrifying. It's really um, awful. And uh, his mind was ravaged. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know who anyone around him was. And it's... Um, and sort of the consensus of anybody who knew him in those late years was um, even the very worst among us don't deserve this. Like this, this contextualizes the, the terror of the human experience, the possibility of terror in the human experience. And so that was really eye-opening to me. And then um, a really important person who I talked to was Ivy Mirpole, who made the documentary Bully Coward Victim and who is the granddaughter of um, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. And so she, um, and so to hear her have a very um, complicated and compassionate and intrigued interest in Roy was um, really moving and mind blowing to me. And I was like, okay, if this person can have this kind of voracious interest in this person, then I think we all have the ability to. And then, you know, Ron Nicewaner wrote an extraordinarily human character, which I think is really brave and really tough to do with um, a historically reviled person. Does that change now how you look at some of our contemporary bully coward victims? It is, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, it's hard. It's really hard to, um, you know, have compassion for somebody who has an outsized amount of power and it wields it um, unkindly. That is real, it's really hard to find compassion for those people. But uh, 
at the end of the day, everybody is a human being. And if you're going to take on the mantle of portraying one of those people, you have to um, put your own personal judgment aside. And um, I think that is the thing, for better and for worse, that theater is that that theater and art is for is for um, igniting the empathy engine in people. I want to ask you one more thing because um, when I think about trying to cultivate empathy, this is a tough city to do it in. This is a really really tough town. Yeah, because we're just trying to get from point A to point B mm -hmm. without losing our minds, right? Yeah. And I read an interview with you where you said, I love New York, I hate New York, I'll yeah. never leave. Yeah. For those looking at New York from the outside and those of us inside, this is a tough town to love. Yeah. What, how do you do it? How do you wake up in the morning, Will, and feel like <laughs> I'm never gonna leave? You know, it is so tough. I'm sure like you can see on the, uh, in these cameras, like I am schwitzy. <laughs> I am so hot and sweaty. It's so intense. And for me, the, the summer is really like the most difficult time in New York City. It smells bad. We're all just like, you know, sweating constantly. It feels like you're swimming through a jacuzzi when you're going to work. Um, but at the same time, I am doing the thing that I love most in the world. Um, I don't get to do this anywhere else in the world. I'm on Broadway playing one of the most ca complicated characters I've ever played. Um, and I, and, and my community is here. There was, a, there was a moment where I was really convinced that I was going to leave New York. When I was playing Roy, I, we filmed that in Toronto and I was like, okay, here's, here's how it happens. I'm gonna fall in love with Canadians and I'm gonna peace out on this country. And um, it just, I just wound up missing the theater community really badly and missing my people and realizing that um, we have a, 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 a really special tribe here. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, I, I just saw Merrily. I just saw Merrily. We roll along. It just closed. And the, um, the sort of catchphrase of that show is, who's like us, damn few. And I think that applies to artists and theater artists and New Yorkers and really anybody who has close friends. Like we, you know, and... Um, and OA fans. And OA fans. Yeah, I mean, who else learned all of those crazy movements and did them in your living room alone during the pandemic just to feel alive? Like us. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, you get it. <laughs> Who's like us? Damn few. Yeah. Will, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. I love, love the show. And for those who can't come to New York and see it, you can listen to it. And listen to the soundtrack. It is all bangers. Bangers. You know, bangers. When, yeah. you, when you stop listening to espresso. Just... Yeah, yeah. Give, give Stereophonic a shot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching Salon Talks. If you had a good time, why not subscribe right over here so you can get more conversations with your favorite artists, actors, directors, writers, comedians, musicians, politicians, everybody you love and I love too. And while you're here, why not watch another video right now?